All right. Now, 1 Corinthians 14. I mentioned earlier I've been waiting to, to preach this sermon. I haven't touched this subject for a little while, and I've been wanting to do it. And 1 Corinthians 14 is basically entirely dedicated to this one subject. And it's one subject that, because of, of false religions that are out there today, it's kind of a big thing. It's kind of a big issue. And a lot of people ask about this, and a lot of people get confused about this. And that topic, of course, is speaking with other tongues. Now, the, you know, the, a lot of people call it speaking in tongues. That's not a phrase in the Bible, it's speaking with other tongues. But regardless, I'm not even going to get nitpicky about that tonight because everybody knows what I'm talking about here. Everybody has heard, at least in this room, I assume, of these churches that they, they have speaking in tongues as part of their service. It's something that they do. It's this, um, well, I'll get into to all of the details on that later. But we've all probably heard of this before. And I'm here to tell you that, that, that what, you pro what probably comes to your mind when you hear about speaking in tongues is false. It's not true. It's, 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 it's not of God, and it's, not, and it's not what the Bible is talking about. So first, keep a bookmarker here in 1 Corinthians 14. Since we're dealing with this subject, we're going to go back to Acts chapter 2. The most common uh, denomination that you will see uh, that, that believes in, in speaking in tongues is the Pentecostals. The Pentecostals derive their name from the event in Acts chapter 2 of the day at Pentecost. Okay, And in Acts chapter 2, we will see a group of people speaking with other tongues, which is why we're going there to begin with. Now, the Pentecostals believe in many things that are false, but they believe that, that a person can lose their salvation. And many of them, you know, Acts 2 is just huge for them. That's like the foundation of their denomination. They have um, Acts 2.38 is, is what a lot of people will, will quote as being like the gospel. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And many of them will believe you have to be baptized in order to be saved, and they'll point to that verse saying, See, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And you know, I'm not going to go into all the meaning of that. I've done it in other sermons uh, where they don't understand the word for, that um, you don't need to be baptized in order to, to have your sins remitted. You get baptized because your sins have already been remitted. But um, we're going to look here in Acts chapter 2 in verse number 1. We're going to start reading here because this is a big event that happened in Jerusalem. This is a big event that, that happened where people had been gathered together from all over the world to worship the Lord, and they were all in one place, and God performs this great miracle. But let's see what the, what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and get our clear fundamental doctrines from the Bible and not just from what churches teach or believe. Look at verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, in context, this is talking about the disciples. Okay, this is talking about the early church, right? There's like 150 of them gathered together in one place, and this big event comes. They're sitting in this room. A great sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they're sitting, where they're congregated together, verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. What a great event. I mean, what a miraculous event. Obviously, this is of God. These, these split or cloven tongues, right? Almost like a snake tongue, right? And it's on fire and it's resting above all of them. Verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this is power given from on high, power from God, of being able to speak with other tongues. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. It's important to understand. I mean, it puts it there for a reason. Hey, there's people from all over the world here at this time. And they're able to speak with other tongues. Now, that word tongue, not to be confused, uh, you know, we don't use that language very much today, that word tongue. It just means language. And we'll see that here in Acts chapter 2, that tongue and language are used interchangeably just giving you that, that definition that that's what it's talking about. So when you hear tongue, all that's talking about is a language. It's not difficult or hard to understand at all. Um, 
Verse number six. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. So when the news starts to spread, right? This is when it's noised abroad. People start to hear, what in the world? You know, these people are all speaking in other languages. They're speaking with other tongues. It says the multitude came together. So a whole group of people came together and it says they were confounded. They were confused. Why were they confused? Well, let's keep reading. It says, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So there you go. It's referring to them speaking in tongues. And it says, hey, we could hear them speaking in our own language. So people that were there out of every part of the world, you know, and, and we'll just put this into today's um, countries, right? I know that there was different stuff back then. It doesn't matter. People that came from Arabia. Hey, I could hear people speak in Arabian. I could hear people speak in my native tongue. People from Poland. Hey, I can hear them speaking Polish. People from, you know, China. I could hear them speaking Chinese. And they were all able to hear them speak in their own native tongue. It's a great miracle. Verse number seven. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So again, you see, they, they go back from saying language to tongue. You'll, they'll, they'll do that all throughout the chapter. They're saying, aren't all, this whole group of people here, the people that were gathered, the disciples of Christ, they're saying, aren't these all Galileans? I mean, they all grew up in Galilee. They're all from this area right here. How can they know all these different languages of like everybody from all over the world? And it is impossible. There's no way they can know it except that God had given them this great gift of being able to speak with other tongues. Verse number nine. And now it's going to list off just to prove that the, 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 the speaking with other tongues that they were using were all known languages. They were not some bizarre unknown language that was just make up, made up that nobody in the world knows. These are all languages that they knew because the people listening were able to say, hey, I could understand what that person's saying because that's the language that I was born in. I know that language. Verse number nine, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? You could not get any clearer in this story that this is definitely talking about languages that were spoken in the world at that time that people were able to understand them exactly what they were saying because it was their own language that they heard. Verse 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And it goes on and on. And you know, the people standing by were like, the people that couldn't understand the languages they were saying, they're like, what, are these guys drunk? Because they, they had no clue. They probably had never even heard those languages before. Right? So it sounded real funny to them, and they're just kind of thinking, like, these guys must be drunk. They don't know what they're saying. They're babbling. But no, that wasn't true at all, because there's obviously people that were able to understand what they were saying because they were speaking their native language. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14. I got a lot of content to cover, so I'm going to try to go pretty quick. So um, try to keep up with me and write notes if, uh, if I'm going too fast. But it was important to get this foundation, though, that we see that when we see the first time that this great miracle has ever been performed, that this gift has ever been given to people, we see that it's very important to see that it's, it's talking about legitimate languages. And you know what? That doesn't change throughout the Bible. A tongue is always a language. 
And it's always, just like all the rest of the spiritual gifts, it's given to profit other people, to be edifying to other people, is the whole point of the spiritual gift. The other people that benefited in Acts chapter 2 were the people that spoke those, spake those languages that were there, just there temporarily. Why? Because Christ had just resurrected from the dead and they were all gathered in one place. The gospel can be preached then right there in Jerusalem and these people from all over the world can hear the gospel in their own language and bring it back to their home countries and just spread the gospel like wildfire. That was the purpose of, of, of him even them being, being able to do that. Now it continued on. They continued to have this gift other than just in Acts chapter 2. But we're going to read this entire chapter, 1 Corinthians 14. Paul goes into detail about this specific gift, about speaking with other tongues and, 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 and what it's for and, what, and the way that it should be you know, used, this gift that, that you have. Look at verse number 1. Let's start off in this chapter. The Bible says, follow after charity. Of course, chapter 13 was all about charity. And desire spiritual gifts. So it's good to want spiritual gifts. It's great. Hey, desire them, want them. Ask God to give you spiritual gifts. He says, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So he starts right off the bat saying, look, if you speak in an unknown tongue. Now that word unknown, it doesn't mean inherently that it's just unknown to everybody in the entire world. It's just unknown to those around you. So in this room, if, if someone were to speak, you know, I don't know, Japanese or to speak some other language, if, you know, it would be unknown to everyone here. That would be an unknown language. Nobody here knows that. It doesn't mean that nobody in the entire world understands Japanese. I mean, that would be ridiculous. It's preposterous. It's stupid. But it's just unknown to the people here. He says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. He's saying, if you have this gift of being able to speak with other tongues, and you're able to speak in Japanese, for instance, I, like if I had this gift of being able to speak with other tongues, and I just said, I just started preaching in Japanese, you guys aren't going to understand a word of what I'm saying, and basically all I'm going to be talking to is God. It's going to make zero sense to you. You won't understand anything. So he says, um, you know, you, you speak unto God. He says, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mystery. I mean, I could be preaching the best sermon I've ever preached in my entire life, but all I'm going to be doing is preaching it to God because you guys won't understand it if it's in an unknown tongue. Verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So he's drawing the difference here. That's why he said in verse 1, but rather that you may prophesy. He said, desire spiritual gifts. Yeah, that's great. One of the spiritual gifts is being able to speak with other tongues. He said, but rather that you prophesy. Because if you had this great gift of being able to speak with other tongues and no one understood what you're saying, then who cares? It's worthless. But if you're able to prophesy, if you're able to preach, if you're able to, to teach people, said, he that prophesies speaks unto other men to edification. You could build other people up. Hey, you can help those people out. It's going to do them some good. It says an exhortation and comfort. I can give you some comfort. I can give you some, some support from God's word through prophesying, through preaching. Verse number four. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. Again, there's that, that, that uh, the same wording, rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. And in chapter 12, when he went over spiritual gifts, we saw the same exact thing. The Bible says, you don't have to turn there, in chapter 12, verse 28, the Bible says, And God hath, sent, hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, and then finally, at the end of this verse, diversities of tongues. It's listed last in this list of, of and he's listing them in order. First, second, third, after that, and then this, 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 this. And tongues are at the bottom. And he's saying, look, speaking with tongues is great. 
Good. You could reach more people. Hey, I pray to God, you know, I would have really been uh, able to communicate better with the woman that I spoke to out today in Spanish if I had this gift of being able to speak with tongues. We ran into someone today. She only speaks Spanish. My Spanish is okay. Sometimes I can preach the gospel and get people saved, and sometimes I can't because I don't know enough of the language to be able to have a full conversation with people. I would have loved to have the gift of, of being able to speak with other tongues when I was speaking with that lady because she didn't understand English. And that would have, would have come in very useful. And yeah, would to God I had that gift of being able to speak with other tongues. But you know what? He said it's better that you prophesy. It's better that you um, have these other things that you can do and, and being able to edify the whole church rather than just being able to sp uh, speak with tongues. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Again, the, the focus being on the people. The edification, the comfort, the prophesying, the preaching to people, the word of God. And he says, look, if I come unto you to speak in other tongues, what good is that going to do for you? What is that? What profit is that going to bring you? It says, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So he's likening being able to speak with other tongues to people who don't understand it to, he said, things without life, like an inanimate object, like a trumpet. He said, if someone blows a trumpet and you know, all throughout history, these instruments were used in battle and in war. If you had like a real big army gathered together on the battlefield, right? The, the, the trumpet would give you what command you're going to do. You know, whether it's charge, right? Da, 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 and everyone would charge. You'd hear that same type of music. But if you didn't know, you know, if, if the person blowing the trumpet screwed up, and they, and they didn't do the right, you know, like the, the right sound for the charge command. And they're like, <laughs> and it, you know, like, like if I were to try to play a trumpet, you know, it would just sound like really awful because I don't know how to do it. Everyone would be like confused, you know, what, well, what are we supposed to do? Was that, are we supposed to charge? You know, you would have, you have no idea because it wasn't uh, distinct. You didn't give the distinction. You didn't, you, you, you know, people weren't able to understand what that sound was that came out of it. And he's saying, the same way with tongues. You know, if you're speaking with these unknown tongues, no one's going to have a clue what you're talking about if they can't understand it. And that's why it's way more important to be able to speak to people that can understand than to just speak all day in this, in this unknown tongue. So he says here in verse number um, 9, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. And just on a side note, I know this is talking about tongues, but words easy to be understood is extremely important for a preacher, for someone who's prophesying and preaching to the church. You know, I could stand up here all day long and use all these really big words and, you know, all the, 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 the words that people would learn in, in, in the cemetery, I mean seminary, you know, about, about uh, eschatology and, and all the different studies of the Bible and um, your soteriology and everything else. And people are going to be like, those aren't words easy to be understood. And it's going to go over everybody's head. Even if what you're saying is really, is really good or important or whatever, if it's not words easy to be understood, you're going to lose it on everybody. And, there, and, and it's going to do no good at all. Other than people might just think, oh, wow, he's really smart. Who cares? I don't care what people think about me. My education is being called into question all the time by people who don't like the things that I say. It's not because they know anything about my education. It's just because they don't like what's being preached. So they just say, oh, yeah, you're uneducated. Okay, I don't care. I don't care if you think I'm uneducated. and educated. <laughs> Words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? We need, we, you know, we need to be able to use words easy to be understand, understood so that people can grow from them, learn from them, and um, it makes sense. Verse number 10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. 
Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. It's just like we saw in Acts chapter 2. The people who didn't know those languages, they're like, they just thought they were drunk. They're like, what, are you guys drunk? They had no idea what they were saying. There was no benefit to those people who didn't understand the language. Verse number 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. He's saying, you know, I know how much you're zealous, how much you really want these spiritual gifts. And you know what he said in the beginning? Desire spiritual gifts. That's great. But seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. That's the whole point. What, what do you care about having these gifts for? Is it to lift yourself up, to show how holy you are? And honestly, the churches that believe in this stuff, that believe in, the, in, the, in the, this twisted version of speaking in tongues, where they just kind of rattle off whatever, they just, just oh, blah, 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 and, and I mean, I don't even probably can't even mimic it very well, but nobody understands what they're saying but why, what, what do they get out of it, though? Oh, that person's in the spirit, and you get a slap, pat on the back, and look at me, I'm speaking with other tongues. That's what's really behind it, is the, look how spiritual I am. Which is not the reason to desire spiritual gifts at all. That's the exact opposite. It's not to lift yourself up. It's to lift other people up. It's to edify them. It's to be a benefit to them. Hey, I, if the Spirit of God came upon me and I, I was able to speak with tongues this evening when I was preaching the gospel to that lady, I wouldn't care that it was, you know, like, I wouldn't try to put all the, the focus on, oh, man, I was so spiritual. I spake with tongues. It would be for her benefit. And that would be the only reason. And, that, and glory to God for that, for her to benefit from that, from, from that miracle, from that spiritual gift. It, had nothing, it would have nothing to do with me. But that's not what we see in the, in the Pentecostal churches. I once spoke, spoke to someone uh, a long time ago in Phoenix, out soul winning, and he said that um, he would pray in tongues. That's how he would pray to God with, other, with, these, you know, with the angelic language. And is this unknown tongue. And, you know, they, that kind of made him think that he was so spiritual. And his family looked at, oh, yeah, he prays with tongues. And it's ridiculous. And, and as we keep reading this, we're going to see that is not of God. That is not what God designed it for. That's not what God is talking about with other tongues. Let's look at what Paul has to say about that. Verse 13. We'll keep reading here in, in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 13, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So he's saying right here, and this is exactly what this guy was doing that I was talking to. He had no idea what he was saying. He's saying, well, I'm just, as the spirit gives me utterance, I'm just just praying to God in some weird language. He didn't know what he was saying. So the Apostle Paul is saying right here, look, if I pray in an unknown tongue, a tongue that I don't know, a language I don't know, he said, well, yeah, my spirit's praying, but my understanding is unfruitful. Said, I don't even know what I'm saying. It's good for nothing, which is why he says in verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. What's he saying? I'm not going to pray in unknown tongues that I don't even know what is saying because it is fruitless. It is useless for me that, yes, the prayer may still be being made, but that's not what I'm going to do because I want the understanding. And he says, I am going to pray with the spirit and I'm also going to pray with the understanding. I am not just going to pray in some unknown tongue because it's no use. It's useless. It has no benefit whatsoever. And notice, if Paul is able to say, I will pray with the understanding also, he has control. He is the one in charge of whether or not he's even praying in an unknown tongue or not. Otherwise, if, it just, if it's something that just came over him and he had absolutely zero control over that, then how could he even say, make a statement like that? But these people that believe in the speaking in tongues today, what happens to them? They all say, oh man, the Spirit of God just came upon me and I just started speaking in these other languages, in these other tongues. 
all of them. They are not in control. The Bible said, look at, jump down to verse 32 here in the chapter, chapter 14. The Bible says, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So when you have a spiritual gift of tongues, hey, it is subject to you. That means that the prophet's in charge, that you are in charge of what you're saying, that it is not controlling you, but you are controlling it. You are the one in charge. It is subject to you. You are able to control when or, when or not you speak these, which is evident also here with what we saw the Apostle Paul saying, look, if I'm praying in an unknown tongue, I don't even know, you know, it's unfruitful to me. And I'm just praying to God, it's unfruitful. He says, I'm going to pray in the Spirit. I'm going to pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the understanding also. I'm not even going to sing songs in a foreign language. I don't know what they are. I'm not going to sing with, with, with other tongues that, that I don't know. He says, I'm going to do it with the understanding also. As I mentioned earlier, you know, unknown doesn't mean unknown to everyone in the world. It's just relative to those around. Let's look at verse number 16 here. We're going to continue on. Verse 16. Else, when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? You know, when we, when we uh, pray as a group, as a church, we come together here. We just did earlier during announcement time. We made a prayer. Oftentimes, at the end, people, when, when people will hear a prayer, they'll say, Amen. Right? Other people sitting in the congregation say, Amen. Meaning, I agree with that prayer. I'm with that prayer. That's what Amen is. It's just an agreement. You're saying, Yes. Amen. And he's saying, If, if I'm up here speaking another language and I'm done with my prayer, how is everyone else going to be saying, Amen? <laughs> How's anyone else going to be able to agree with that prayer because they don't understand? Verse number 17, For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Yeah, good job giving thanks to God in another language that people don't know, but no one else is edified by it. No one else heard what you said or understood what you said. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Now he's talking about within the church specifically. He says, yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding than just go on this big oration, 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. You just go on and on and on. He says, I'd rather just be able to speak five that everyone could understand. The whole point of the gift of being able to speak in an unknown language is to edify other people. And it was forgiven for a sign. We'll get into that in a little bit. Verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but under, in understanding be men. And you know, this is the point of the sermon tonight, is that so that you could be not children in understanding what this whole doctrine of speaking with other tongues is about. God wants us to understand. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. Look, I want you to understand this. Don't be children in understanding. Be grown up about this. We need, to, we need to, to learn and to get this knowledge and not to be children because what are children? They're tossed to and fro with every, every uh, wind of doctrine by the slight of men, people who are cunning and crafty, lying in wait to deceive. It's out there today. People are deceived by it. People are deceived by this, this, this fake power. People are deceived because, uh, you know, they, 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 want to, they want to see something with their eyes. They want to have the, the physical proof, you know, the, the proof of God's existence through form of some kind of miracle. And they'll, and they'll look to the, to the tongue speaking of saying, oh, yes, this is true because they're speaking with these, other, you know, in, in tongues. As opposed to being able to just look at the scripture that God has given us and know what's right and wrong and believe that. But let's keep reading here. Verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Look at verse 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. 
But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So he says right, right here, tongues are for a sign. And it's not for believers. Believers don't need to see someone speaking with other tongues. Which is why speaking with other tongues is not for the church. When you come together and, and congregate in church, it's a group of believers that come to sing praises unto God, to fellowship one with another, and to learn and to be taught the Word of God. That's the point. It's not to come and just speak with other languages. That is not the purpose of church. He says specifically, right here in verse 22, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe. It's not for the other believers that are congregated here. He says, but to them that believe not. Like it was at the day of Pentecost. They were amazed. The unbelievers were amazed that they could hear people speaking in their own language and they were preaching the word of God. They were able to receive God's word in their own language and that was the whole point of that. It was a sign. Wow! Aren't these people Galileans yet? They're speaking just like they came from my country. And that does have power. It doesn't have any power to someone who doesn't know the language at all. To everyone that's congregated in the local church where we're all pretty much have grown up together and all pretty much can speak the same language. But it has the power to those that believe not. And it's a sign for them. And also, when it says here, tongues are for a sign, I believe that wholeheartedly that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we don't see that so much today. You don't see this, this gift being given out. Because people say, oh, well, what, well, isn't God able to do that today? Yes, God is capable of doing that today. But there are things, there, are, there were certain gifts that were given to the disciples, to the apostles, that I don't believe are being given out by the Spirit today. And the reason why is because they were for signs. Now, the, and I'm not going to go too in-depth with this because we've got so much to cover, but it's important to understand this. The reason why the, the signs were there is that they were give it, providing the ample proof because between the Old Testament and New Testament, there were significant changes that were made to worshiping God, to following the Lord, to what you did um, and what God expected of you. Think about it. All of the sacrifices were done away with. That's a very significant change. If your religion taught, the Old Testament taught, you need to be bringing these sacrifices, you need to follow these feast days, you need to be doing all these things. And now all of a sudden, that has drastically changed. And now we're talking about, hey, Jesus Christ and his resurrection from the dead, as opposed to the, you know, looking for the lamb and, and through the, the, the view of the Old Testament. And now we're saying, hey, this has been fulfilled. This has been fulfilled. And this is the new teaching in the New Testament with the new covenant. Making a shift like that, you got to make sure that's coming from God. Because you don't normally just change, you know, what's been established by God that you know, hey, this came from God. You know, the law of Moses, we know that came from God. And this has been established. Now we're starting to do things a little bit different. Is that coming from God? Well, yes, it has. And the signs, the, these, these spiritual gifts that they were given were proof and they were signs that confirmed the words that they were speaking because they had the power of God upon them. But the prophesying, it says here in verse 22, serveth not for them that believe not. So when unbelievers come to church and they hear the preaching, it's really not going to do them any good because the things of the Bible, things of the Lord are spiritually discerned. So you can hear this preaching from the Bible as an unbeliever, as someone who's unsaved, you're unregenerate, you don't have the Spirit of God residing inside of you, it's not gonna, you're not going to get it. They don't understand. It's, it's, that's why it's for them that believe. And that's why we don't go out on the streets, we go out knocking on doors and preaching the gospel. We don't just go preaching sermons about, you know, 1 Corinthians 14 or 1 Corinthians 12 or 11 or any of these things. We don't bring that stuff up because I'm not going to preach a sermon to someone who's an unbeliever about the things of the Bible when the natural man doesn't receive it. Verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues... And there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say that ye are mad? So what's he saying here? That, now that word mad, it doesn't mean angry. Right? When, when the Bible says here, if someone comes in, and, and this is what he's, this is what he's the, the picture he's painting. He says, 
If the whole church has come together in one place, like we are tonight, everyone's here have, holding a church service, and everybody's speaking with tongues. Everybody's just, just, you know, different languages and all this other stuff, and it's like chaotic. People come in like, what in the world? If someone comes in and says someone is unlearned or an unbeliever, they show up, they go, oh, sorry, I came in a little bit late, and everyone just speaking all these different languages. He says, will they not say that you are mad? And that word mad means crazy. They're going to walk in, they're going to be like, these people are nuts. This is weird. I am out of here. And that's what happens in the Pentecostal churches. You show up and you got all people just shouting all over the place, supposedly speaking in tongues, and they're crazy. And you know what? I think they're crazy. <laughs> Will they not say that you are mad? But, verse 24, but if all prophesy. So people are preaching. You come in and you hear preaching, and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned. He is convinced of all. He is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Because he'll be able to understand to some level. Now, he's not going to get the preaching overall until you get saved. But you can still understand the words that are coming out of a person's mouth. Right? Even an unbeliever can, can hear the teaching on, you know, for example, in 1 Corinthians 11 about uh, the length of your hair, right? An unbeliever could come in and understand those words that are, being, that are being said, that are being preached. And, you know, that can, can, can hit home. And the Word of God could sink in. But if I'm just up here just preaching in some unknown language, they'll have no idea what's being said. It's not going to do them any good whatsoever. So we see very, very, very clearly here that this tongue speaking is not for the church. It's not for to be taking place inside of church. It is a sign for unbelievers. The church service is and you know the church service is not for people getting saved either. It's not the the the, the church service is not a tool for people to get saved at. Now people come here and they end up getting saved. Praise the Lord for that, but we do not gear our church services for the unbeliever. We do not gear church services just to get people saved. You know, people think that it's a, it's a bad idea to think, oh, I need to bring this person to church just so they could get saved. No, you need to be able to give them the gospel so that they could get saved. Hey, you want to bring someone to church? Great. I'm not saying don't do it. But what I'm saying is don't have this mentality of thinking I need to bring people to you to get them saved or to the church to get them saved so that at the end of service when they do the big altar call and hey, is anyone here you know not saved you not know for sure raise your hand your heads bowed eyes closed oh, I see that hand you know come walk up and you have to walk up in front of everybody and make some big profession to get saved no why don't you just give the gospel to that person and get them saved that's what, what, what the Bible's talking about is, is that every believer should be able to preach the gospel to every creature, not bring them in to the, to the gathering of believers to get them saved because the church is here for the edification of the saints. And that's another reason why you know, the tongue speaking is not just for the church. It's, it's not for the church at all. That was something to be done out for unbelievers when you're doing the soul winning or whatever to be able to communicate with them. So what are some of the attributes of the churches that promote the speaking in tongues? And you know what? I, I, I'm sorry if this offends you. Uh, hopefully it doesn't, but I'm going to call out the false churches, the false denominations, uh, for one, so that you don't get deceived by them, but they need to be called out. People are deceived by these churches every day, and it's, they, they preach damnable heresies and preach that you can lose your salvation, and it's not of God, it's of the devil, it's of Satan, and I'm not going to stand for it. I'm going to expose it tonight. And some of the attributes of these Pentecostal churches that promote this speaking in tongues within the church, it's completely against what 1 Corinthians 14 teaches. These are people that believe you can lose your salvation. They're proud because they'll be saying that you must speak in tongues in order to prove that you're saved, as I mentioned before. It's a way for people to show how spiritual they are by, oh, I spoke in tongues last week. Oh, I didn't see you. you know. And they're always looking out for that. You know, I talked to one of my good friends from Faithful Word, used to go to church like this, and he said, man, he's like, 
it was just it was just so much in his head he said I always just really wanted to speak in tongues he's like I, I wanted to do it so bad but I just couldn't do it and I couldn't understand why he said I don't know why I couldn't do it he really wanted to do it and he, he admitted he said you know what there's some people that like they would just fake it because they wanted other people to think that they're speaking in tongues too and they just whatever they would do but I know that there are also people that they're not faking it they are being controlled by another spirit and there is an utterance coming out of their mouth that they are not making up on their own but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you right now, it is not of God. That is of the devil. And I believe that those people are, are devil-possessed. It's always the same. Why? They'll say they don't know what they said. They, they lose consciousness during that time. It's like a blackout. And they'll ask people, so wow, did I speak in tongues? What happened? Oh, yeah, man, you were going, you know. And, and they have no idea what's going on. Does that sound like the Spirit is subject unto them or that they're subject unto the Spirit? Because when someone is devil-possessed, when someone is demon-possessed, they are not in control. That bad spirit, that devil spirit is the one in control. But the spirit that we get of God, God allows us to still be in charge. We, are, you know, The Spirit from God is subject unto us. God will give us the tools and the gifts and he'll bless us with these things, but he still gives us the will and, and the power to be in charge. God can give you the spirit, he can give you the boldness, but it's still up to you to open up your mouth. Just as much as it was up to Paul to say, I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the understanding also, because he's in control. So I'm not just going to start praying in an unknown tongue that I don't know. I'm not going to be edified by that. Now, if there was someone over here that needed to hear the gospel, guess what? I'll speak, I'll speak with another tongue to him. That, you know, a language that he's able to understand. But uh, some other attributes, you know, this is the holy rollers. And, you know, I don't know if you ever heard holy rollers. It's kind of a, an older term. It's not used as much today. But basically, the, the term literally comes from these churches where people would roll around on the ground. Or they'll call it getting happy is another thing. You ever see people that are like, they say, oh man, we got the Spirit of God and they just break out into this, this weird, uncontrollable laughter and they'll be rolling around on the ground. It's bizarre, my friends. And it, you know what? It's scary because it's not of God and these people are not in control. It's, um, it's of the devil. Other things that happen you know, in these services where they, where they believe in the speaking tongue, these Pentecostal services, People will be shouting out in the middle of service in tongues. And it, and it happens like all over the church, right? Men and women alike. And usually they'll have a lot of music playing, yeah. right? A lot of the strong beat, and like a rock type of music. And it's going to be going and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. Music, and, and music is a whole other sermon. I preached on that before. Music is powerful, my friends. And you look at the... Even the, the voodoo, you know, the, the African religions and the people are into just Satan worship and stuff, they all incorporate the music into their, uh, what they're doing. And the people who are like the shamans and the people who, are, who use the drugs and induce things to go and visit the spirit world, they all use music. It's like they get themselves into a trance to be possessed by devils. And that's what happens here, too. That's why you're always going to have that, that, that powerful beat music going on in the background right before all these people start, start speaking in tongues. I've seen the videos. Of, I've seen it up on YouTube. I've seen people you know, in the churches that were, I mean, it wasn't just a show. It wasn't people making it up. It was, it was real video of, of a church service, and this is going on. And the people are just all over the place, start start you know, speaking in tongues, quote unquote. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 9. All these different attributes, when you see this, it's better described by this passage in Mark chapter 9. The things that are observed in these unsaved churches. It, it's, it, it doesn't fall in line with the teaching in 1 Corinthians 14 about tongues. It falls more in line with this story in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse number 17. We'll read there. 
Verse 17 of Mark 9, And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answereth him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And Jesus saw that the people came running together. He rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. So here we see, what is this? A demon, right? Possessing a man. And we see the attributes. What happened? The spirit was able to cry out. The spirit was able to speak, right? The spirit was um, tearing at, you know, it says it teareth him. He foameth. He was foaming at the mouth. You'll see that at the Pentecostal churches, people foaming at the mouth. It, sa it says uh, he was gnashing with his teeth. It says that he was um, falling on the ground. Right? The holy rollers are falling on the ground. They're just falling over uncontrollably as they're speaking in tongues. This is not something you find in a Christian church service. It is not something you find in the book of Acts. It is not something you find in, in 1 Corinthians here. It is not something you find in chapter 14 of the Spirit of God is just going to come over you and you will just be not in control anymore and you're going to be rolling on the ground foaming at the mouth and gnashing with the teeth. That is demon possession. And the people that aren't faking it, because I believe a lot of people are faking it, the people that aren't faking it, this is what I believe is happening with them. They've got another spirit, but that spirit is not of God. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I'm doing better than I thought I would be doing at this point with time. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. There's a lot of content here. Verse number 26. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together? Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edify. I mean, this can't be stated enough. Over and over again, the whole point is let all things be done unto edifying, edifying other people. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course, meaning one by one, and let one interpret. Is this what you see at the Pentecostal churches? At two, at the most, three? No, you see a bunch of people standing up, just not in order or anything, simultaneously, and, and just, just claiming to be speaking these other tongues. And then it says in verse 28, but if there be no interpreter, he's saying, look, if you have people who want to speak in an unknown tongue, fine, two or three of you, in order, and let one person interpret so that everybody can understand what is being said. Sounds like a good level of control there, by the way, also, for someone to say, yeah, I, I have something to say, I want to speak, but I, you know, it's speaking in an unknown tongue. Okay, well, we need someone to interpret. But if there be no interpreter, verse 28, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So if there's nobody there to interpret what you're saying, then you just shut up. You keep your mouth shut in the church because that's not going to edify anybody. It specifically says that there needs to be an air interpreter before you even start speaking. How many of these churches that have people shouting in tongues ever find out first if someone can interpret? And I'm not talking about someone that just claims, oh yeah, I can understand what he's saying and just make stuff up. Because I'm sure that happens too. Oh yeah, they're saying, that, you know, whatever. And just making up whatever comes out of their heart. They don't understand what they're saying. It's not a real language. It's not one that they understand. 
but you have to have the control, again, that control to be able to, to find out, is there someone that can interpret what I'm going to say? It's speaking in an unknown tongue. If not, I'm not going to say anything at all. But if there is, it's going to be done in order. It's going to be by course, one at a time, and only a couple of us will be able to do it, two or three. Now, here when it says two or three, you know, we have a very small church. We're not going to have anything like this at this point. But that church was much larger. There's a lot more people, and so it makes sense. Yeah, you might have a few people that could speak in an unknown tongue, but you have to have someone to interpret. Verse number 29, let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So he's saying, look, if someone's sitting down and say, hey, man, I got something to say. He says, okay, well, let the first hold his peace, meaning he stops talking so that the other person then has a chance to preach. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets for God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints God doesn't make things confusing he's here to set things straight when you have a church of people all just just shouting different things and speaking in other tongues or whatever that's confusing who do you even know who to listen to? You've got someone over here, someone on your left, someone on your right, and they're, and they're all just speaking these weird things. That is confusing. God is not the author of that confusion. Because if you've got something to say, if you've got something to preach, let it be by two or three. Now look at verse 34, because the other thing that we'll see in these churches is that it's men and women that are standing up and, 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 you know, and speaking in tongues and everything else. And he even said in verse 31, that's why I believe this verse is even here. In verse 31 he says, For ye may all prophesy one by one. But just to make sure you understand what he meant by you may all may prophesy, he says he's referring to the men that are able to preach. Because verse 34 says, Let your women keep silence in the churches. Now look, this that one statement alone, this, that one section that I just read, infuriates people these days. It makes them madder than hell to hear, let your, what do you mean let your women keep silence in the church? What do you mean? Women can do whatever men can do. And this is the thinking that is going on in our culture today. And it's wicked and it's of the devil because this is the word of God. That says, let your women keep silence in the churches. It's not me that's just some bigot or some misogynist or some authoritarian that's just dictating, these are my rules. This is the word of God. Now, if you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again for your sins because it's written in the word of God, then are you not going to believe that this is also the word of God? Paul himself even says this. Look, he says, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Very clear statements. And I'll stand on this any day of the week, 100%. I will never back down on this. I do not believe for a second that women should be speaking in the church during the teaching time. Because it's forbidden. Because it's not forbidden permitted according to God's word. And how many of these Pentecostal churches are telling their women to keep silence and not speak in tongues? It's not happening. Many of them have female pastors behind the pulpit teaching, which is clearly in opposition to 1 Timothy chapter 3. You know, I want to know where their wife is because they're supposed to be the husband of one wife according to the Bible. But why would you confuse yourself with the Bible? I don't know. And, and Paul confirms this in verse 36. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. He's saying, oh, you think you're spiritual? You think you're Mr. Spiritual? Well, then you better be ready to acknowledge that everything that I just said here, all these words... They're the commandments of God. This is not just my opinion. These are God's commandments. That tongue speaking is not 
for the church, Mr. Spiritual. And I get sick and tired of these people. I, you know, I used to run into them all the time in South Phoenix. Not really so much here. We don't have so many of the, the charismatic Pentecostal churches up here. Thank God. But down in Phoenix, man, there's a whole bunch of them. And you run into these people, and I mean, man, this is all the time. Well, do you speak in tongues? Have you speak in tongues? And that's always their question for you. It's not, are you a believer in Christ? Because that's my question to them. You know, I'm out there trying to win souls. Like, why have you spoken tongues? Well, I speak in tongues all the time. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, show me how spiritual you are. Yet, if we were to go through verse by verse here in 1 Corinthians 14, I bet they don't acknowledge that these are the commandments of God and that everything that they're doing with their Mr. Spiritual speaking in tongues goes contrary to what Scripture says. That they practice all of that completely in opposition to what the Bible clearly teaches about this subject. And even if you think that women don't need to be silenced in churches, well... Are you going to acknowledge that the things that are written here are the commandments of the Lord or not? I think they are. Praise the Lord. I, I believe that 1 Corinthians 14, every single verse is the Word of God. 100%. And that it means what it says and it says what it means. Amen. Whether or not this world or this culture or this society likes it, that's the Word of God. And I love it. It's not because, oh, you hate women. I love women. I've got one for a wife. <laughs> I've got three little daughters. I love them all. But if God has a commandment here, I respect what God has decided, and I think he probably has a good reason for it. Even if I don't understand what the reason is, I'm going to accept it and just say, well, that's what he said. So I'm going to adhere to it. And that's good enough for me. No, I do understand the reasoning for this. The Bible talks about it in other places. It says, you know, God made Adam and Eve, and it said that the man was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Why? The serpent beguiled Eve. Adam was not deceived. He knew that it was sin to, to take of the fruit of, of the uh, knowledge of good and evil. He knew that was wrong. He knew it was wrong when Eve gave it to him. Now, he made, a bad, he made the, the stupid choice, but he made the choice. And you could go into the, the reasoning why, you know, try to get into Adam's mind why he did it. His wife had already done it, and now he's going to, you know, whatever. But the Bible is very clear about, about uh, one of the reasons for the, for the roles that, that God had given unto men and women. And a lot of that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, that the woman was deceived by the serpent. And in order to be watching over the house of God and to be teaching and preaching... You know, um, God made women to be, to be ruled over by their husbands and that they're more followers than leaders anyways. And that's the way that he designed us. So not speaking in the church during the teaching time makes sense. And this was says, hey, if you want to learn something, ask your husband at home. And he should be able to teach you because he's your spiritual leader. But it's what the Bible says. Now, I, won't, I won't apologize for it. I won't, I won't skip over it. I'm not going to be like, oh, people are going to be upset at this one. I better just skip past this one. No way. That's not going to do anybody any good. That's not going to edify anybody. I'd rather know what the truth is, even if it hurts, even if it stings a little bit. Like, oh, man, I can't believe it says that. I'd rather just know what it says than for people to hide it from me and just gloss it over and, oh, yeah. <laughs> you, hear the, you hear these phony baloney preachers, it's hysterical the way they try to explain away and basically will just tell you, well, that's not really what that means. See, you don't, you don't understand. You don't understand the Bible. See, back then, and they'll go on this long diatribe of why what it says isn't really what it means. And they'll just talk and talk and talk and talk until you forget what he's even talking about. And that way you could just skip past it. it I've, seen, I've seen it done before. It's ridiculous. But no, we're not going to hide any truth from you. We are Word of Truth Baptist Church. We love God's Word. Let's finish off the chapter here. We're almost done here. Verse number 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. 
Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So he's saying, look, covet to prophesy. Preaching, edifying the church. That's what's way more important than being able to have this gift of being able to speak with another tongue. A tongue that, that very few people, especially here, would even be able to understand. It's way more important to be able to edify the people, be able to preach, be able to prophesy. And he says, don't forbid to speaking with other tongues. Like, I don't forbid speaking with other tongues. But I do forbid the, the devil possession where nobody knows what's being said at all and it's not of God. Now, if someone had the, the, the spiritual gift of, of being able to speak with other tongues, praise the Lord. I'm not going to forbid that. But I'll tell you what, if someone wants to preach and they speak in an unknown tongue, we're not going to do it here unless we have an interpreter. Unless the whole church could be edified by what's being said. We're going to follow the scripture to a T. 1 Corinthians 14 lays it out perfectly the way that we deal with this. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the clarity of your word, dear God. I don't understand why sometimes people have such a hard time um, knowing what's right and wrong when you have just spelled it out for us, dear Lord. Uh, I, I believe your words, God, and we are doing our best here to try to follow them 100%. God, I pray that you would please just help, help me to be able to be a comfort and, and be able to preach edifying things under our church to build up everybody here tonight and um, to be able to serve you better, to be able to be founded in our doctrine and in our belief, dear Lord. And um, I pray that you please help us to go out and teach other people and especially converting them unto Jesus Christ, dear Lord. Please bless our efforts here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.